So we're going to start with a short introduction about our project and our guests. And then we will look at how we actually define digital youth work and how we can how we can reach young people who are hard to reach. And after that, we will look at how we can measure the impact of digital youth work. Then at around 5.15, we will have a short break and then open the discussion to everyone. So you will have the opportunity to ask questions. Feel free to write them in the chat. As we are recording the webinar, we uh, decided to just use the chat for questions. Um, and if you have any questions um, during the input, just post them anytime. And also, if you don't feel comfortable um, writing in English, just you can also post the question in German and we will try to translate them then. And yeah, during the discussion, we will try to answer as many as possible. Yeah, and then we will close the event at six. So I hope I didn't forget anything. But then we can start introducing the project and our guests. Teresa, you want to start? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Teresa Wintersteller, and I'm part of the COEC team, as, as Shania mentioned. And I want to welcome you all um, in the name of the whole project team of the Department of Education at the University of Vienna. And the last year's work in our project, COACT, Co-Designing Citizen Social Science for Collective Action, was actually the reason why we host today's webinar. And we are so happy that, that so many of you could actually join. And I will now talk a little bit about the project so you have an idea of what we do. And for this, I will start the presentation. I prepared one moment, please. So there we go. I hope you see it well. Perfect. Um, so COACT is a three years transnational project um, funded by Horizon 2020, funded by the EU. And it is organized by a network of cooperation partners uh, based in Barcelona, based in Potsdam, based in Vienna, um, and also um, of some transnational organizations such as Global Innovation Gathering or the Open Knowledge Foundation. And COACT um, works with the research approach This is called citizen social science. Um, citizen social science is defined as participatory research, co-designed and directly driven by citizen groups sharing a social concern. So what does this mean? Um, this means that citizens who are affected by a social concern participate in an equal manner in research. So collaboratively, researchers and citizens plan research together, collect and analyze data together, and transform the research results into concrete action. So COACT seeks social transformation in areas of social inequality and tries to further develop and define citizen social science as a research approach and make it accessible also for civil society organizations or citizens alike. Um, and to achieve our goals, uh, we are conducting research in four case studies. Um, the team of Barcelona uh, is tackling the concern uh, of mental health and how to better support people with mental health issues. Uh, the team in Buenos Aires is concerned with environmental justice and how to include citizens in the problem definition when it comes to environmental pollution. Um, the issue of gender equality is tackled um, in a little bit another way uh, and in via open calls for external organizations. Uh, it's called Cascading Grants. And we are uh, at the University of Vienna. Sorry, I cannot. There we go with the University of Vienna are concerned with uh, the topic of youth employment and work together with young people who participate in educational matters, measures within the framework of education and training until 18, or as we, we call it in German, Ausbildung bis 18. And in our project, uh, young people can, can voice their needs, their interests and ideas about how to adapt and improve and create educational measures 
And in doing participatory research, we, we contribute to create a supportive system for young people and their educational pathway. And although like these topics of the case studies are quite different, uh, the structure of the project is aligned. This means that all case studies collaboratively engage citizens in research um, and build up a knowledge coalition. And this knowledge coalition consists of civil society organizations, of concerned people, of political players, of relevant institutions. And the knowledge coalition is an integral, integral part, not only for transforming, not only for research, but also for transforming these results into concrete actions. Um, so that's a little bit about our project. And I hope you have a little bit of an idea of what we are doing. Um, if you want to know more, uh, please visit our, our web pages. We have one for the whole project in English. Uh, we have another one for our case in Vienna. And of course, we are present at Twitter and Instagram, where you can follow us too. And I now give the floor to Alicia. Alicia, very welcome to our webinar today. Do you want to, to introduce yourself? Yes, hello. Uh, thank you so much for having me involved in this uh, fantastic webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Alicia Pavluchuk, and uh, I am a researcher in digital youth work and digital youth inclusion. And at the moment, I work for the United Nations University in Macau, although I'm based in Europe because of COVID. So, uh, yes, uh, I have been involved in the area of digital youth work for a number of years, I would say about 10 years initially, beginning with the use of participatory video for storytelling. And over the years, as technologies have changed, I kind of started using digital technologies uh, to work with young people. But in recent years, I have been primarily looking at the research side uh, of digital youth work interviewing digital youth workers, learning about their practice, their fears, their aspirations. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to definitely tap into some of the research that I've done previously on impact evaluation as well. Uh, so yes, I'm really looking forward to today's uh, event and thank you again for having me. You do you want to continue? Sure. Yeah, uh, thanks everyone for being here from my side as well. I'm Juha Kivinen, I come from Finland. Uh, currently, I'm employed uh, full time in an organization called Verke, and we coordinate the Center for Expertise on Digital Youth Work in Finland. Uh, it's kind of cool that in Finland we have the system of youth work centers for expertise, so we can really kind of drill down and focus on a certain certain area of youth work and for us it's been digital youth work. Today I'm kind of sitting on two seats or have two hats because I'm here as myself rather not from Verke but uh, it's the saying that uh, you sing those songs who you are implied, employed by so so I think it's still uh, fairly there. I also work a lot as a freelancer in the European training field. I, I worked on I've kind of lost count and of course COVID is distorting all the whole, the whole time field, but um, I work as a freelance trainer on digital topics, especially as a facilitator in, in uh, uh, youth worker mobility projects, especially. And we are also involved in a lot of uh, European uh, projects uh, within, for example, Key Action 2, so strategic partnerships. I'll refer later to some resources you can tap uh, that have also been produced in those uh, those kind of uh, projects. And my kind of orientation is I come from a youth work background. I'm a practitioner originally, and that's that's kind of the orientation that I have, even if um, it's been already, I think, five years-ish since I last worked full-time uh, with young people. But we do get to do that now and again. But mostly we train youth workers in my organization. And it's a fun, fun task, especially when you get to focus on all the cool new stuff on digital youth work. But thanks from my side also for the invitation to be here today. Okay, thanks, thanks for your introductions and uh, thanks for letting us know you a little bit better. And I now want to directly dive into our topic of, of digital youth work. And to be frank, uh, COVID-19 put our attention to this topic because uh, we couldn't do our work 
like we normally uh, do it. And we needed to, to build up know-how, how to work online with youth very, very fast. And probably our audience is much more experienced in this regard. Um, but I, I still want to, to start with some basics, namely like, what are we actually talking about today? And you and Alicia, maybe you two could share a little bit, what is digital youth work for you? What aspects of youth work count as digital youth work? And also like how did this line of, line of work change um, with recent circumstances such as COVID-19? Let's start with that. Um, you can choose who wants to start. I'm happy to start, yes. Um, and yeah, I, I think this is a very good question because uh, we do have the definition of digital youth work uh, out there and it kind of clearly aims to cover every aspect that you could possibly um, use of, yeah, that you can think of, right? Because uh, I think nowadays youth work is essentially digital youth work because technologies are embedded into young people's lives as well as youth workers. So in a sense, even prior to COVID, uh, digital youth work has been around for a long time. It just never had the actual name. And I think it's really tricky to kind of, um, kind of fit everything into the digital youth work. But for me, uh, the way I understand it is the practical use of digital technologies uh, in youth work from having an, uh, you know, an, an iPad at the youth center to actually building robots uh, in non-formal educational setting. Uh, but then again, there are issues that um, digital youth workers face in their practice. Uh, and these are unique issues that very often aren't covered at schools or at home. And this is where young people bring their, you know, their very uh, unique needs or secrets around their use of the digital technologies. Uh, and I think that's also digital youth work. So navigating this new reality where we just don't know what we are supposed to do. And uh, in that sense, digital youth work takes place when both youth workers and young people are trying to kind of define or co-create their understanding of, you know, their lives in the digital world. So, so I think that's, um, that's my understanding. And I think there is, uh, it's a fluid process, you know, it's, it's constantly changing. And the way, because the second part of the question was around COVID and I think, yeah, COVID has definitely kind of turned us all into digital youth workers. So I think uh, something that I uh, found in my research previously um, was that many youth workers uh, had no choice but to become digital youth workers, right? So it's it's a natural progression and nobody asked them, you know, oh, do you want to become a, a digital youth worker? Do you want to, you know, it was put on them and I think and the COVID situation uh, made this very obvious uh, because all of the youth workers had to become digital youth workers, whether they liked it or not. Uh, so I hope that gives you an idea of uh, how I see digital youth work. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's all I have to say. I don't want to ramble on, and I think you will have uh, more to say, something something more useful, perhaps. <laughs> I don't know if it's more useful, but it's at least uh, a complementing perspective. Uh, Alicia said that all, all youth workers had to become digital youth workers. And I would also say that all, all digital youth workers had to become uh, online youth workers. Because online youth work is only one aspect of the whole digital youth work spectrum. Like Alicia also mentioned that it can be about tackling the phenomena and changes brought on by digitalization um, uh, for, for young people and for the youth, youth workers and the youth field internally as well and that kind of took uh, all the other stuff kind of took a back seat uh, at least up to a point because covid forced everyone to only act online so i at verka we've been advocating for several years also for within the finnish youth field and and in european projects that uh, digital youth work has to be seen more as a wider phenomenon so not only using uh, digital uh, means as a tool, so as, a, as the online aspect, uh, but also using it as an activity like building new engaging things around digital approaches and also as the content. So addressing how young, how young people face uh, digital media daily and how it affects their, uh, their lives. But all of the other stuff really took a back burner when COVID hit for obvious reasons. And I think the interesting question will be, how do we come out of this? Like, how do we move forward? What do we learn, uh, et cetera? 
I mean, for example, for me, uh, my job has changed a lot uh, in the last year uh, because I'm usually, I'm a maker enthusiast. So I'm the guy that builds robots as an engaging activity uh, with youth workers. And I, I talk up with youth workers about how, what kind of skills young people can build uh, when they're building robots or, or how programming is actually a, more of a, how should I say, more of a creative skill and a creative process rather than a technical skill. Uh, but all of that has kind of disappeared because you can't build robots when you're online because you can't get the robot building kits to, uh, to the young people. So this has been challenging for, for trainers and uh, especially youth workers and especially those youth workers who've never done uh, any kind of online youth work. I'll give you a national example from Finland um, we, we have a Discord server, one very, uh, very, a lot used platform in Finland as well. And um, we had about 120 members in our uh, Discord server before the pandemic hit. And within the uh, first couple of months, we had an influx of about 1,000 new members. And even when Finland has the reputation, and I think rightly deserved reputation, as being ahead in online youth work practice, a lot of the practitioners were saying, I've never done anything like this before. How do I do this? So even in Finland, the practice had been in the hands of a few individuals. And hence, we come into things like how do organizations actually support all the digital youth work that is happening. But now I'm rambling a bit, so hopefully that was a bit of a uh, additional perspective to things. If I might add something, uh, I think that's something that I thought about is also um, some of the workshops that I've done over the last year. And very often these workshops were for the digital youth workers and youth workers and the young people to kind of try to understand their new terms and conditions of their reconfigured relationship, right? So, uh, so what's acceptable, what isn't acceptable, who's terms are we actually participating on so who is in charge of our participation are these you know digital technologies so understanding the the digital technologies there and so most of the workshops that i run as part of the organization that i set up some time ago called digital bees was actually thinking about the the the, the participation itself so the the yeah the digital youth work as a well i guess the political side uh of of your online participation. So in a sense, the workshops that I run were on data literacy, you know, the issues around misinformation during COVID, which is a big one, and kind of tapping into how these technologies really work and how they influence our thinking. And very often these workshops were actually useful both for the youth workers and uh, the young people. Uh, and I think uh, in a sense, uh, COVID kind of made it more, more important, more, more urgent to understand these things. So it wasn't just fun stuff like previously around storytelling and which is also extremely important, uh, but the, the data literacy uh, was a big one. So, so that's the change that I've also noticed in my practice. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we, I think we can we'll come back on the political part of that because I find that really interesting what you said. Uh, but thank you for giving us like an idea about the to use work. Um, Teresa already um, said that we also had to change our concepts and ideas due to COVID. And what was actually really interesting that in discussion with discussions with youth workers, we found out that it's not at all self evident that young people can work well digitally, can work well online for several reasons. And so even though working online seems or that seem to be a good alternative for us, we realized pretty soon that there are factors of exclusion coming with it. And we already, um, like in our invitation text and everywhere, it was, uh, we stated like, when we talk about how to reach young people, and I just wanted to say that, that does not mean for us that young people have a problem or are the problem, whether we ask ourselves what are the excluding socioeconomic uh, structures and the missing resources in terms of technical devices, for example, behind these forms of exclusion and um, how we can remedy them so that as many young people uh, as possible can actually participate um, 
Yeah, because we also see like there are some young people who have no access or just limited access to um, the smartphones or laptops, social media. And there are others who can't imagine a world without these things. So therefore, my first question would be like, who is actually excluded from digital use work and why are young people not participating and what are these um, what are the excluding factors? I can start on that one. Um, I think a lot of times when when uh, youth workers are building building up new services, um, my experience is that the there are a lot of kind of assumptions on how how young people tend to use digital media. The most dangerous dangerous one may be being this digital native uh, kind of. Um, or the, the misuse of the term digital native. Uh, using it in the sense that oh, young people know all of this stuff anyway, so we don't have to figure it out with them, which is obviously false. Uh, there is definitely a digital divide, and it's not only about age. It's about uh, access, uh, like you highlighted, Shania, access to technology, but it's also uh, whether they have the skills to actually use that technology on the same level as their peers, because obviously if you can't use the technology that the youth work offering is built on your at a disadvantage to everyone else. Um, of course, um, offering digital digitally uh, or offering youth work services digitally, it can be uh, much more, more inclusive. Uh, you can have uh, have young people participate that couldn't participate in a in a physical activity due to um, physical or social constraints or or simply the um, the distance to the place where the offering is is held, uh, and a lot of young a lot of youth workers have said uh, during the pandemic that they've reached uh, young people they've never reached before, and this is of course a good learning experience. But then again, have we stopped and looked at um, are there young people that we haven't reached since the pandemic started? I believe there are these young people as well. So what do we do with the young people who who don't? have the access to our digital offerings. Yeah, I would agree with uh, what Juha has just said. And I think um, there, there are several ways that we can think about it. One of which is obviously the, the kind of most common idea of what digital exclusion is all about. So having access to devices, uh, having reliable Wi-Fi, you know, there have been, uh, there has been evidence, um, you know, around the world that uh, many young people didn't have access to reliable Wi-Fi. They had to, if they had any devices, very often they had to share them with their siblings. So the quality of education obviously wasn't there. And uh, because my focus at the moment, um, my research, focus is on gender digital inclusion. I can say that from the statistics that I've saw, uh, especially girls do not get access to, uh, to digital technologies at home because they have to kind of take on all the caring responsibilities. And I think it's uh, important to know that from the statistics that we have so far, uh, at least from 2019, the, yeah, 2019, it was published in 2020, we know that 95% uh, of young people in Europe have access to you know, digital, uh, good internet connection. They have experience of, of using digital technologies. But we still have that 5% of uh, young people who, who are in this so-called digital poverty. And then yet again, we have to think about the statistics that are out there and how certain governments are actually reporting these things and who have we missed in that data, you know? So perhaps, um, thinking about all the groups, the intersectional issues that have to be covered when it comes to digital inclusion. Uh, so your, your gender, your race, uh, your social class, these things are you know, affecting the way uh, you access uh, things online or not. So I think it's uh, fair to say that many young people have been excluded uh, from education, from um, their normal social life. And in fact, I have been 
writing a, an article recently about this and it seems to me that when we think when we look at all the not the data but perhaps the blogs and the literature the, the articles that are written about the COVID situation in young people you, we can see that there is either this uh, area of um, this, these narratives of young people being extremely empowered the uh, agent of change that you know that the, the COVID has provided us with an opportunity to tap into you know this this new um, youth-led uh, you know organizations or, or things like that so there is this uh overly romanticized uh narrative of uh, young people smashing the, the the power systems uh but uh and then so it's either the the best of the best or we have the totally excluded young people who are from the dis disadvantaged backgrounds and i think we kind of forget that there are young people in the middle as well who have uh, you know everyday issues with access they might have computer but it, they don't have the wi-fi or so i think uh so uh the, the narrative uh, around young people being extraordinary or just you know just not having it having any opportunities is a, is a good one but i think we have to think that these things mix so the other point that i wanted to also add here is that um although maybe over the last year we've tried to include as many possible as many young people as possible into the digital world uh, we also have to realize that by digitally including them we are uh, like deepening the problem of the big data divide so young people are digitally included but you know we are facing another exclusion which means you know they're uh, fair uh, meaningful conscious participation in the digital world so i think uh so 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 these are some of the issues and obviously as always there's no simple answer uh to these things and i'm just looking at my notes if i have anything else that i've missed <laughs> but i'm sure we're going to cover it later on so there's a good question in the chat which i think is kind of related to this stephanie is asking what target groups you re reach on discord and and uh, it's a software used mainly by PC gamers. Sure, that's what it originally is. And I think here's a kind of mix of uh, like the traditional youth work is that uh, we go where young people are, right? And this applies also to online environments to an extent. But for Discord, it's not so much uh, going on to the servers where, where kids already are. Uh, so for example, around a certain PC game, you might do youth work there as well. You might do youth work in the gaming environment as well, like on Minecraft or whichever digital game. But the Finnish example of using Discord has mostly been uh, setting up uh, own Discord servers. So a lot of youth actors have set up their own communities. And I think a Discord, Discord, while it's originally, it was a communication tool, it kind of evolved into a community building tool. And it's also a good, uh, place for or good platform for youth work to build their own communities and that's how it should be kind of seen not as a platform where you go because kids are already there it's not that much even about the platform it's it's about what kind of communities you build and that's the thing okay yeah thank you for that alicia you said something about the big data uh, divide and also in our work, um, we just realized we ask a lot uh, of young people when we ask them to choose like WhatsApp or other um, tools, um, because even I sometimes don't know what I agree to when I download some apps or something. And this is some, like a big concern, like how do we communicate these things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I'm a researcher in data literacy, digital inclusion, and I myself am excluded from certain things because that's the way things are when it comes to, you know, the surveillance capitalism or whatever you want to call it. We just don't have access to, to this type of information. So I think, um, first of all, I would say that uh, to all of the youth workers out there, you know, it's not your entirely your responsibility to change the world. I think, um, you know, you have to kind of obviously try your best, but don't push yourself too hard because uh, uh, from my experience, uh, some of the work that I've done, you know, there's lots of shame and guilt uh, among the youth workers uh, feeling that they're not adequate, that they don't have the right skills. Uh, and I would say, you know, first of all, let's just acknowledge that none of us knows all of it. And I think your 
general is particularly difficult, so you are amazing. <laughs> okay, so uh, the second part is essentially around the data literacy and, you know, how do we even get started when it comes to, uh, to, to the big data divide. Um, here, um, I think, yeah, there are lots of things that can be done and, uh, but it really depends on how you work with your group. Um, so um, I could give you, I don't know if you're looking for a specific example of activities or do you want me just to kind of look at, um, you know, there, there are lots of resources out there which are now trying to tackle, uh, you know, the, the different aspects of the um, political, um, you know, the political influence into, into the data, big data society. And um, maybe I can share a link later on because uh, previously be uh, when I worked at the University of Liverpool, uh, we actually um, had um, a project which was, uh, we got funding because uh, essentially, uh, you know, the Cambridge Analytica scandal happened. And out of a sudden we realized that, uh, uh, that these things need to be researched uh, you know, in, in a meaningful way. So during that project, which is called Me and My Big Data, um, we kind of created the, the website, which has got all sorts of different resources that are out there uh, for young people. So, um, so, so I could maybe share that link later on, uh, but just, um, um, just to say that um, I left that project last year, so I haven't been able to update that website, but it's a good start to see activities and tools that are out there uh, that, um, that could uh, help you. One of the things that I did with me and my big data uh, was, for example, creating your data sculptures, you know? So we would take, so these were offline activities, for instance, but I'm sure you can uh, translate them into a digital way. So thinking, just having the initial conversation, you know, what does your data think about you? What, how do you think uh, your, you know, your data represents you as a human being and to what extent do you have free will? And I know these are philosophical questions and sometimes it's really hard to even uh, start, you know, creating these activities. But I would say that the resources that are out there uh, and that I'm, I'm just going to share a link after this, um, they are, could be very helpful. And one of the things that I also used is the um, there is uh, the the five rights commission. So it's uh, the young people's digital human rights, uh, and um, I would say that just looking at the digital young people's digital rights and actually discussing them with the young people uh, might be a good way to, uh, to to start the conversation. You know, are they aware of their human rights and uh, that they are they actually have human rights online as well? It's not a different world that you know they they do have rights but yeah i agree with you in a way that you know technology is kind of uh, like a, an an extra actor in this uh, you know relationship between young people and uh, youth workers and it's um this might distort or might uh, uh, influence the 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 reality that they're in so if you are a youth worker and you have young people who is also kind of looking at something on Instagram, but not looking at you and then feeling a little bit sad because they saw something on this, it's like, you know, it's things that obviously haven't been researched yet. So I don't have a specific example, but I hope that answers your question to some extent. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So when we come back to the, but like to the how to reach young, like how to reach youth, um, you had um, you are also um, giving advice to youth organizations, right? And what would you tell them, like to be more accessible, to be more inclusive? Mm, uh, how to be more uh, inclusive, or inclusive. how to reach them? How to reach them? The first yeah. Place. Yeah. Um, that's always a big question. Um, I, I worked in, in the city of Helsinki for uh, youth participation services for a while and and city of Helsinki had a really admirable stance that we want to get as many uh, kids to participating from uh, diverse backgrounds. So not only the active kids that are supported at home and want to become involved in municipal politics, politics, et cetera, but rather all kids from all walks of life. Uh, and there was, in theory, there was a really good system of, of uh, youth participation in place for young people's initiatives, but eventually they figured out that actually almost no kids knew about the existence of that 
particular system. Now that's always the issue. How do you get word to them? Um, one, one good thing, at least in the Finnish context and in a lot of European countries as well, has been cooperation with the formal education side of things. Uh, because often kids or most kids luckily are in school of some kind. Uh, of course, not all, but a lot of kids are, uh, are in school and schools reach a lot more uh, of the, a certain age bracket than, than uh, youth workers. So if, if youth practitioners have a good relationship with local schools, they can most likely reach a lot of the kids to at least inform of their offerings uh, through the school side of things. Um, apart from that, once you get into uh, getting in contact with kids who actually are in school, always the issue, the hardest kids to reach are probably the ones that would need the youth work services the most. Uh, then it becomes a question of outreach youth work and doing using all the methods of outreach youth work to actually uh, get in touch with the kids, uh, depending, of course, on, on who uh, who provides, for example, social uh, services within your particular area. So getting getting kind of getting kind of networked within the field of different professionals. I think that's one really good way of getting in touch with kids. Yeah, I agree with what you had just said. I think it's uh, tricky to kind of put all of the responsibility on the youth worker to do all of the work. You know, there was uh, times when I was setting up my first digital projects for young people in Scotland, maybe six years ago. And, and we realized that there were so many different issues, um, uh, you know, with young people from different backgrounds, issues that we couldn't deal with because we are not social workers, for instance. So I think having uh, a support network, uh, establishing a support network uh, um, and kind of realizing that it's not just uh, youth worker and the young person, which is probably obvious to all of you, but there is a network of influences and network of people, hopefully, that, uh, you know, young people's digital participation might affect change. And, and it, it, I guess it all has to be considered. And I know it can be unrealistic to do a full analysis of, you know, uh, one young person's digital network, so or however you want to call it. But I think it's uh, maybe understanding the limitations of um, the work that you're doing and accepting that um, perhaps, um, you know, you can't uh, achieve all of it on your own. Uh, saying that, uh, there is also the question of, you know, uh, are we supposed to be um, meeting young people at where they are? So uh, perhaps using Instagram or Facebook to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to talk to them, to uh, learn about their, you know, worries, or should we take them to spaces that are safe and ethical? Uh, and which which part is you know uh, more ethical? I, I don't know, and this is a very open question. Um, yeah, so I think um, I, I I don't really you know I've worked on so many different projects where we failed, where we we tried to engage young people from different backgrounds, and we realized that it isn't always possible. And um, there was a project that I worked on with. Um, travelers community uh, and this was a very challenging aspect because these young people weren't going to school or you know they so we kind of provided them with uh, digital devices twice a week that's what we could do and i think the, the the so yeah so we had to go out there we had to provide food we had to uh, ensure that the spaces are secure that they are obviously it's full and not fully anonymized but also that they are actually doing the things that they want to do um which you know was fashion, for instance, and uh, I didn't feel comfortable uh, imposing my digital literacy agenda, perhaps. Uh, but I guess this isn't really answering question on on how to um, efficiently uh, work with the digitally excluded young people. But uh, I think, yeah, I'm unable to provide you with one single strategy because I think that wouldn't be fair. I think it's also a question maybe of segmenting your approach in the sense that. Um, we often tend to think that um, we need to find one solution for everything, like we need to do all of this on Instagram. There was a question in the chat now also about, about how you use, if you use a platform like Discord, which is uh, fully monetized, I don't quite understand what the question means with monetized, because Discord doesn't make 
uh, revenue out of user data as Facebook and other networks does, mm -hmm. at least to my knowledge, not. Um, but it's, I often use the practical example of, of uh, would you, uh, if a kid has an issue uh, they want to discuss with you, a sensitive issue, would you go in the middle of the living room at the youth house or you, would you maybe take them to the office where you have a bit more privacy? Like segmenting your approach, you can maybe reach kids better on Instagram, but then again, it's not maybe ethical to uh, tackle sensitive issues on Instagram. You might do it on Discord. You might do it maybe in a secure messaging service um, like Signal or Telegram or something like this. So kind of figuring out what exactly you want to do want to achieve and how and kind of working from that to identify what service you want to use for that. And of course, if we build our own services, then we are fully in control of, of the uh, term time conditions and how the data is used. But we all realize it might be a bit uh, cost prohibitive usually. And of course, the commercial uh, commercial uh, offerings, they will always be more attractive. They have armies of people figuring out uh, how, to, how to get users to stay on that service for as long as possible. And we as youth workers, we will never combat that. We have to be clear of what we are offering and that's not user retention in our service as such, just for the sake of user retention, right? So it's always, always tricky figuring out this balance between self-built things and and using commercial services. Yeah, and I think if my, my, I might just add one thing, I think this is what you pointed out, the limitations of digital youth work, you know, and uh, uh, the research that I'm currently doing around uh, gender digital inclusion, I have done some interviews with people all around the world, kind of working primarily with girls. And one of the things that I've learned so far is that digital, technology might not always be the right thing to use, you know? So uh, we have this idea that uh, digital participation always leads to empowerment, but actually in some situation, it might not be the right tool. And uh, including young people uh, by digital technologies might not work in certain, um, you know, uh, certain places or certain cultures or certain local cultures, localized uh, in young people's lives. So I guess it is, uh, again, just worth noting that uh, we cannot solve all of the solutions with digital youth work. Okay, thank you uh, that you are like multitasking, <laughs> already taking questions from the chat. Um, yeah, I think thank you for that. And I think with a look on the time, maybe we go to the next question. I, I take over for our, our next topic. Um, thanks for like this very, very interesting input. I think um, what, I, what I take with me from, from your uh, things right now is that first of all, networking is a very important tool for digital youth work, actually. Like you need to stay connected with other services and other offers. And that also like segmenting your office, I think that was a very good buzzword, like not every tool is usable for everything uh, and that we have to think about what we use for, for which offer and for which goal also. And yeah, and also maybe that um, digital youth work, um, the last thing you said, Alicia, like with digital youth work is not for everything and not for everybody. And also maybe combining approaches might be good. I think also about outreach youth work. For me, it's very uh, not digital, but very, um, Face to face, so maybe also combining approaches might be a way to go if we don't reach young people, and yeah, and also accept learning processes. Like we don't have to know everything uh, right away, but we will fail and we will continue uh, growing in our digital um, as digital beings. Actually, so okay, thanks, thanks for everything. Um, and since time is flying, I want to turn now to our second topic, uh, namely how we actually evaluate or also measure that what we do works. Like, how can we say what I do has the impact I want it to have? And as we've seen in the discussion right now, like employing digital use work, it needs a lot, of, a lot of thinking about who is participating, who are we reaching, how we are creating offers that are inclusive and accessible in a digital environment. So 
but how do we know that we're achieving these ambitious goals and, and, and to what extent are we having the impact that we, that we would like? So maybe we start with the first question, like how, how do we measure it? Like, how do we approach that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to start because apparently I'm the impact expert, but uh, let me say that, yes, I've studied impact evaluation and I'm still doing it. Uh, and I don't have a perfect solution for impact evaluation. I, I don't think anybody does. And uh, this is specifically difficult when we are talking about digital inclusion and digital youth work, where there, is, there isn't really a set of metrics that we should be using to, to measure it, you know? And if we do use any metrics, uh, I think uh, then we are not doing it in the right way. Because to me, the digital participation cannot really be uh, put into a box and, um, uh, you know, just um, kind of measured with, uh, I don't know, 10 indicators that uh, say, oh, I can click, uh, um, I can find the search to whatever. But, but there are, uh, you know, definitely frameworks out there uh, that you can use that might help you. And I'm going to sh share the links now. But if I may, I'll just kind of go into uh, some of the research that I've done in the past and uh, some of the discussions that I had with youth workers uh, around uh, impact evaluation. But um, so could I possibly share my screen quickly just to sh share some of the research that I've done? Uh, that's already two years old. So, uh, so I, I would need to get your permission to actually share the screen. Okay. The co -host. I think it should work now. Okay, can you see my screen now? No, unfortunately not. I can also make a host, just have to give it back to me. And yes, I, I've got it, I've got it. I think this sh it should work now. Yes, perfect. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so um, the research that I've done, um, you know, two weeks ago, uh, sorry, no, two weeks ago. Two weeks ago is the digital, gender digital inclusion and other things. But when it comes to digital youth work impact evaluation, uh, here are some of the key themes that I found in my research and I call them the three goals of impact evaluation. Uh, so the youth workers that I spoke to, they said, oh, you know, um, yeah, it's all fine, but when you're doing youth work, you kind of have a set of metrics and you know what you need to measure. And very often it is uh, the vague idea of empowerment, uh, employability, who's going to, and all of these things, you know, which are in a sense also problematic because uh, there has been evidence that if youth work is driven by certain goals and agendas, it's really meaning, it's really losing its purpose. It's uh, uh, underlying the, the, the basic relationship with the young people because, you know, um, some of the literature that I've read in the past is like young people, youth workers said that, how can you, how can possibly young people trust you if at the end of the activity, you give them a form and they need to fill it in and they need to do it in the right way. So you keep the job and you keep the funding <laughs> in your organization. So the whole idea of, uh, you know, impact evaluation, you know, kind of, yeah, it, it, is, it is problematic in itself. But going back into the digital youth work, uh, the first problem was around like able, yeah, how are you actually sense impact? What is impact in digital youth setting? There's, you know, we, we use so many different tools, we kind of uh, play around with so many different ideas. So nobody knows what the digital part is. Yeah, we know things about youth work because we have been measuring uh, for a long time, but the digital element, like you just don't know. Then the second problem is, uh, and that's probably also quite common in youth work, is that you have to chase proofs of positive impact. You know, so we all have to be digitally empowered. We all have to say that, you know, all this using Google Drive has changed my life or, so there is this constant uh, chase. So you kind of running through the project and you are trying to document the positive uh, things that happened because that's what you need to have at the end of your project. Uh, so I'm just getting it work wrong here because the third one is, oh yeah, so let me just clarify. These two goals are quite similar. So the first one was about the, the ability of like sensing that things are changing but not having the tools to capture it or not having the time. So how do you actually capture that impact? And the third one, the third little goes there with a phone, he is essentially, or she, or you know, they are essentially uh, worried about the fact that uh, they don't know what digital impact is. So, so these were the three goals that I ad identified. And I guess it's, um, you can find these slides on my slideshare, uh, but I think it's fair to say that 
uh, there was quite a lot of anxiety uh, in the digital youth work field and nobody has the time to critically think about impact evaluation or uh, have uh, been able to provide meaningful participation in impact evaluation. So uh, yeah, now uh, have I found the perfect tools to measure impact evaluation? No, I haven't. Uh, but I've collected some of the tools that are out there and uh, probably they might be a little bit, um, perhaps not uh, up to date uh, just now, but uh, I can definitely, um, oh yeah, this is just a little battle between the metrics and the digital youth work impact. If you see that on your screen, then essentially this is the, the feeling in the digital youth work sector that I experience. So it's a, it's a constant battle, right? But then again, if you go to my website, this is where I sort of try to publish my PhD results in an accessible way. And here, um, so I'll, I'll share my, my, my website with you in the chat. Uh, and this uh, here, uh, I have some recommendations for practice policymakers and digital youth work project funders, because in the end, it's all about, you know, funders uh, that um, they kind of come up with the terms and conditions of impact evaluation. So here you can see um, some of the youth uh, and practitioner led evaluation recommendations. So these recommendations were created both by uh, the youth workers, but also three groups of young people who kind of told me about the way they felt they feel during the evaluation. So um, some of the things that they said is that it's like a final exam and they need to pass it and, you know, they need to get it right. So they they realize that it's on them to ensure that the funding um, will will be essentially sustained in, in the club. So so they don't have um, uh, the freedom or uh, to, to actually genuinely think about what they've learned or they haven't learned, uh, but also they feel co-responsible for, for the entire thing. And, uh, and the final thing is that they don't know what happens to the data that is collected. You know, it's, it's a, a purely bureaucratic process. So I think uh, starting from the recommendations that I have, and this isn't, again, a tool, a perfect tool, but these are the things that came out from the digital youth work field is that you could perhaps try to look at some of these areas, right? So young people said that, uh, you know, it has to be accessible. They need to be able to uh, understand what they're doing and it shouldn't be, we shouldn't be using the typical evaluation impact uh, vocabulary, which could be extremely confusing. Uh, it should obviously be anonymized. Uh, some of the young people told me that, oh, you're sort of anonymized, but the youth workers know that this is going to be, that this is Johnny because he, this is his right, you know, uh, your, his, uh, his writing style. So uh, they're, not, they're not grateful, you know, so like the, these could be the ungrateful people in the community. So they suggested that having it fully anonymized, so, so they feel safe to say whatever they say. Also using digital tools, uh, encouraging critical reflections, Independent of funding, this is where I'm talking to funders. This is where young people and youth workers said, funders, please give us freedom. Again, informed and accountable. So after the evaluation has taken place, could we please come back to the young people and say, look, this is what we found, you know, do you think this is the right thing to do? And I know this can be very difficult because uh, impact evaluation is like an ad hoc activity, which isn't being taken seriously. And I totally get it, <laughs> you know. Uh, finally, the recommendations, you could have a look at the participatory uh, types of evaluation, playful, uh, serendipitous, so just, you know, giving it a go, seeing what happens during the process and well-timed. So uh, not having them at the very end of the workshop, uh, just throwing surveys at young people and say, now tell us how digitally empowered you are, uh, which I'm not assuming anybody is doing who is who's here. So you can have the little graphic here and please don't tell me if there are any, um, um, uh, you know, errors there and any, any spelling errors because um, I don't want to know. So here are the 10, uh, 10 things that you can maybe have somewhere around you and kind of think about these areas. But then again, I know that some of you think, okay, well, she hasn't given us any tools, you know, uh, but I, I would say that you probably use some of these tools already and in your practice. And because I haven't actually written a book about, um, you know, youth participatory evaluation, I'm more interested in the process and the way we perform it. And yes, it is a bit of a performance because everybody has to play their role to make it all sound beautiful. I would go into this section here on my website and here you can find different um, 
you know, books. And this evaluator's cookbook is an amazing one because it really gives you like recipes for each evaluation exercise. Uh, very, very uh, accessible. And then there, there are some more books here. And so we can just click through and then uh, see at the toolkits that are out there. And of course, all of them have their limitations, but it's really up to you to kind of think about structuring the process so it is meaningful to you and the young people. And there's always limitations, uh, but uh, yeah. So I probably haven't answered your question, but you know, uh hopefully some of this before before i comment uh or have further question i would give the, the floor to you how do you want to add something yeah i i, I could add that uh one thing uh you just skipped over pretty quickly um was the part uh, part about uh metrics versus uh impact uh, was it metrics versus impact? Yeah, it was um, the, the fight, the fight. Yeah, the fight, metrics. fight scene. Yeah, so it was metrics and the digital youth work. So it's kind of yeah, uh, metrics versus digital. Youth. Yeah, like I, I find for some peculiar reason that um, I've, we've had this discussion in the youth field. I've been involved in youth work for about 16, 17 years now, and I feel like people are pretty comfortable in saying that okay, when we are evaluating youth work done at a physical youth house, for example, we are not only looking at how many kids we had per night. That's a simple metric. It's an important metric for funders, uh, but it's not, it's not uh, impact evaluation as such. I'm pretty sure everyone's in board with that. But for some peculiar reason, once things move into the digital world, when we start using uh, social media platforms, when we start using online tools to facilitate youth work, suddenly we're only looking at metrics. So we can say that, for example, or some youth actors have said that they're looking at um, like how engaging they are towards young people. They're looking at likes on posts. And that's a very straightforward metric, which doesn't actually say a lot about what we are being, uh, what is being measured. And I think for me, it also come, kind of comes back to this whole, what do we learn about COVID thing? I would hope that we learn to better recognize the essence of youth work. And whether we're looking at face-to-face at, um, -face offerings or digital offerings, digital youth work offerings, we should always be looking at uh, evaluating the impact of youth work, not ev evaluating the impact of whatever platform or approach we're using, but rather the youth work offering itself. Is that uh, doing the things we hope, hope it's doing? For the youth workers. Um, of course, metrics are super useful, uh, especially in, in this kind of quick uh, evaluation. And yeah, sometimes we are kind of in the trap of what our funders tell us. I think Finland is very fortunate because often we are publicly funded. The core of our youth work is publicly funded. And for example, us in Verke, we are 100% publicly funded by the Ministry of Culture and Education. So we don't have to so much, even we have to define some metrics to fulfill, but that's not the core of the evaluation. So I think, I think it's amazing. super interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think that's amazing because I remember running a workshop exactly on this, on um, impact evaluation with European digital youth workers. And, uh, and it was lovely to hear that there are some parts in Europe which are actually allowing uh, believing youth workers that they are doing the right job without actually uh, assessing every part of their work and i think uh that's that that gives me hope uh but uh, there is there is something that you mentioned and i think um you know the co-creation of metrics so if you do want to use metrics then it's 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 again taking a step back from the assumptions that you have at, about what needs to be achieved you know during this project um but actually co-creating these things with the young people at the very beginning, you know? So like, why are you even here? Like, did you have to come here because someone told you or, uh, you know, so, so, so maybe having that um, honest conversation right at the beginning and then having these conversations all the way through. Um, but yes, I, uh, I agree that uh, the situation in the UK is very different to the situations that are out there. So the perspective that I have is, you know, from the research in, in the UK where youth work is heavily, uh, you know, um, 
quantified and uh, where there's lots of budget cuts and everybody has to prove their value. Uh, and I'm not sure. And then from the European workshops that I've done, there was oh, kind of resonated with some of the youth workers out there. Uh, but let me just add the final thing that I thought about uh, is when it comes to metric, because uh, young people actually told me that they felt um, like just being datafied, like being labeled as numbers and actually not having their voices heard in the evaluation. Uh, so, 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 so some of them in the, the Scottish setting that I worked with, uh, they, they, they felt this way uh, when we actually had the, the time to have this honest conversation about evaluation. Um, so yeah, so so um, there it's a complex pro complex process, but I think uh, if you do give it a little bit of time or maybe uh, implement it into other activities, it can become a little bit more meaningful. And I'm sure that many of you out there are already using implementing um, meaningful activities into impact evaluation. But then again, there's always a question: Is evaluation always necessary? Is it the right thing to do? You know, is it does everything has to be evaluated? Do you always have to prove your own value? And that, in a sense, is uh, is, a, is something that uh, in the evaluation field, uh, in in youth work in, in Scotland, we are kind of trying to push back and say uh, that's undermining the, the the value of the work itself. Um, so yes. See that Teresa is already clicking her mic open impatiently, but I want to add one thing, one last thing, I promise. <laughs> um, I would love to see personally a funding instrument dedicated to controlled failure yes, in absolutely. the sense that if there was a, let's say there's a funding instrument for digital youth work that's based on highly experimental projects that encourages you to fail, say, for example, in a format where if you fail your project, you automatically get a new grant for your next project, as long as you can demonstrate why you failed and what you learned from that failure. Because I think I, I posted a quote in the chat about snowboarding that you have to be falling down, otherwise you're not trying hard enough. And I think that applies to pushing the boundaries of digital youth work as well. Like if you're really pushing the envelope, then you're, you should be failing or otherwise you're too comfortable and that's no way to improve. Absolutely. And can I just add one more thing before <laughs> this is just the final thing, because uh, when we do evaluation uh, kind of the old way, right, and if you use the old uh, metrics that we have, we are not really learning anything new, you know, we are using the same metrics uh, uh, for things that are constantly evolving. These are new things, you know, uh, if we need to learn from the young people about what digital inclusion is all about, because they know uh, which things are changing in their lives. And I think it, it has to be an ongoing and responsive process because otherwise, you know, how can you, yeah, it's, it's uh, yeah. So I think uh, this has to be, so I, I'm up for a failure kind of fund. Let's, let's think about it. Let's get it organized. <laughs> I think a lot of a lot of people would appreciate it also because like it gives you so many possibilities um, to try out new things and like to be innovative um, and I think everybody says always we should be innovative but nobody is funding the innovation so I think there is a gap there um, because it's also um, part of our project and very important to us I want to to address the last question I have to to the to the issue of participation it, it popped up here and there, but I want to, to focus on that um, a little bit more. Like how can we include young people in this evaluating process? Like which tools do you have? Maybe, uh, Alicia, I really like that you shared like all your resources about it. It's a really great homepage. I clicked into it and it was really like inspiring for new tools and everything, but maybe give our, also our audience a little bit of um, some practical experience. Like how can we include young people in a participatory way um, in this impact evaluation, in this um, processes uh, that we are talking about? Yeah, I think um, the whole idea of evaluation should be kind of co-created with the young people, right? So if you really want to understand what evaluation means to the young people, then you really have to have that genuine conversation with them. And it doesn't have to be called evaluation. So right, starting right from the beginning and having that discussion uh, about you know, where we are, why are we here and what would you like to achieve and what are you afraid of so maybe asking these questions right at the very beginning and here you can use different tools you know you can use mind mapping you can use uh you can have individual conversations if you know some of the young people don't feel confident to to, to share these things openly but actually um, 
having that very honest conversation at right at the beginning and mapping out some of the things that you want to um, possibly achieve with this project and then returning to these on uh, you know whatever basis you think is appropriate but uh, to me it is about uh, co-creation of the indicators right so what are we going to uh, to to create what are we going to you know what, what do we want to achieve but also thinking that uh, right so we have the initial meeting we are having this conversation uh, we're taking notes we are maybe doing it in a creative way or uh, you know the the posted notes or mind mapping exercise and i think there's so many tools out there that, that you could use at the moment that i don't think i can just give you one because uh, you know you know what works best for you but and then kind of going through through this uh, kind of uh, on, a, on a regular basis uh, until the end and then actually allowing young people to understand the process uh, to, to to think critically about their experience to uh, to use it to have a meaningful experience so not only uh, thinking about the positive change that is happening to them but actually having that conversation around your fears your vulnerabilities uh, so within these conversations, these could be open questions or, you know, uh, themes that young people can fill in. Uh, but this is very um, broad and each project is different. So I would say you have to, like, I really can't tell you what to do exactly because it is up to the young people. And I think uh, apart from co-creating the indicators, uh, I think it's about uh, trusting the young people to become the evaluators themselves, right? So instead of choosing the right tool, ask young people about the tools that they've used in the past, you know, what was their experience of using these tools? And if they could invent any, what would it be? And here, uh, this was one of the questions that I asked in my research as well when I was young with the young people, and they kind of just came up with so many different ideas, you know, they said, oh, why don't we use like, obviously you create an app, which is a very, <laughs> you know, common one, but uh, some of the young people said that they would draw trees on the walls and each week they would go back to the tree and actually add uh, trunks to kind of understand their progress of or lack of it or no progress or like just so it's positive negative impact or no impact whatsoever so it's uh so it really depends on, on what you like one of the each one of the uh, tools that i've used in the past was actually uh, writing letters to yourself, you know, so we would start with um, just having open discussions, we would create something on the wall, but we would also uh, allow young people to take that minute and write a letter uh, to themselves, and then they would return to that letter uh, uh, next week, and then, you know, in the end, we would discuss these letters, but if, if they would feel comfortable, they could share these with us, uh, and then we could think about how these uh, things uh, are changing in the project. So I think if you kind of think about uh, the some of the things that are there in the recommendations, uh, you know, they they so I'm, I'm trying to link all of these things. So making it a little bit playful, but also understanding what playful means to these young people. Uh, so I think uh, I don't know what at what stage you are with your project and if you had a chance to, to do it right at the beginning to have that conversation to map these ideas with the young people and actually allow them to become evaluators. Um, uh, but if you haven't, then I guess halfway through the project, you can you can you can try it again, and then see uh, young asking people how would you like to report uh, the outcomes of this project, uh, uh, and and yes, if you do have a specific way, so you have to write a report. Okay, you can write a report. But uh, in Scotland, I've seen lots of amazing uh, ways to report impact, and you know, young people created comics, uh, they created films uh, to kind of share their stories. Uh, so. So is this practical enough or uh, would you like me to invent a very practical evaluation story <laughs> on the spot? Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. I think you, you gave some good examples. I really like the tree. Um, I think it's a, it's a good picture um, yeah, to visualize how, how co-evaluation and participatory evaluation could, could work. I would say that the, the one of the books, which is the evaluation cookbook, it has a lot of ideas like this, and it actually has the time, the ingredients that you need, and then you can just kind of uh, turn it into a digital activity as well. Um, but yeah. If um, there is nothing like very important to say right now, um, I would close the discussion uh, for now and, and we go into our well-deserved five minute break. Um, I want to encourage everybody to post their questions um, in the chat. Um, please, 
if you didn't understand something because it was it was going too fast, uh, just put it in, in English or in German as you like. We can translate it. We can, we can pick up everything. Um, yeah, don't be don't be frightened. Um, I'm looking forward to a lively discussion and a lot of questions. And see you in a bit. I would say at um, 20 past five, we will meet here again. See you there. So welcome back. I know five minutes is over short. But yeah, thank you for all the interesting inputs. Now um, everyone else has the opportunity to ask questions. Some have been already asked and also already answered, I think. Uh, and there, like, when you just have a look in the chat, there are a lot of recommendations. Thank you, Alicia. So if you have any more questions, please just feel free to put them in the chat. And there's already one. What could should be the next steps in digital use work according to you? So who are you have to answer? start? Mm, yeah, I could I think uh like right now, going out of uh, the whole COVID thing, it's a matter of uh, recognizing how much practitioners actually have newfound motivation for everything digital. Um, it's recognizing um, what we learned so far uh, during the pandemic about digital offerings, uh, like what we can do differently, and kind of what is worth saving and what is not, because not all digital youth work that's been done during the pandemic, not all of it is uh, something that we necessarily need to keep. And I think finally, while addressing all this is to also have the discussion within the field of, of how, how big of a phenomena digital youth work actually is, or sorry, how big of a phenomena digitalization actually is in young people's lives. I had uh, during the break, I had one slide actually on my chat. So this one of the quotes from my favorite sci-fi authors, Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, and the quote says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So my kind of stance on, on digital youth work and technology is that if we have no understanding how the technological world around us works, uh, it might as well be powered by pixies and stardust. Um, and that applies to us youth workers. If we don't get it, then we don't understand what kind of world young people live in. And for uh, young people as well, uh, in order for them to be able to use technology to their advantage, to take control of the world around them, basically, and not just be kind of caught in the flow of technology, uh, they need to be able to figure out how the technology works. And I think non-formal education and youth work can have a huge role in that. So kind of taking that stance as youth workers, I think is super important right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm just uh, searching for um, some of the, the research that I've done recently around the future of digital youth work. And here, there's a few things that I could share here. Uh, one of which is uh, my kind of recent article for the um, SALTO uh, particip participation and information uh, uh, place, website, uh, organization, still learning what the right term is. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, I, I've done um, quite a lot of workshops over the last year. Uh, not only when it, focusing on digital skills, but also kind of having these um, genuine conversations with youth, youth workers about how they feel about the uh, present times and also the future of digital youth work. Um, so one of the uh, workshops that I run and here I'm going to uh, just drop uh, the, the link to my blog post about it is um, what does the youth work, digital youth work hold? And again, ignore any spelling mistakes. Uh, it's a part of my nature. 
here you can see that uh, there are a few things that, uh, you know, the digital youth workers talked about. And here we were kind of trying to map some of our fears, but also hopes for the digital youth work in the future. And we were actually looking at, you know, how do we imagine digital youth work in 2019? Uh, so way, hopefully, beyond uh, COVID, hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, and here, uh, it was really interesting because, you know, the, the, some of the, um, you can see some of the post-it notes there, uh, some of the different ideas around uh, how uh, the whole concept of digital youth work or youth work will change. And will it become more digitized? Will, uh, will it become up obsolete at some point? There was definitely this fear that, uh, you know, digital tools, AI bots or um, apps will replace the actual need for youth workers themselves. Um, so, so, so there. So you can have a look at, at this blog and, and see some of the key points. It's very accessible. There are just um, you know a few sentences about um, uh, what might happen. But I think one of the uh, important thing here uh, is to say that one of the uh, key uh, concern among the youth workers was that. Uh, many of the uh, public spheres are being digitized, right? So, uh, so when you when you think about the welfare kind of services in the UK, they are being digitized. So, uh, because it's cost efficient, right? So there was this question: Will this also happen to youth work? Uh, because of the budget cuts, and you know, how, how are we going to uh, to progress with the digitization in the non-formal uh, educational setting? So that was one of the key questions. But then again, uh, this article, the second one that I'm going to share just now, is that um, here I had, I run three workshops during COVID and I also um, facilitated like a survey, um, kind of open-ended uh, questionnaire uh, with youth workers around Europe. And here I kind of look at three things that um, I identified so far. So these were, these were just prelim preliminary uh, analysis uh, uh, and I'm writing the full thing just now uh, so it should be available hopefully soon but one of the big thing uh, that came out from these uh, from the data that I've gathered was that you know finally we have to take digital youth work seriously so strategic planning uh, actually taking into account that uh, youth workers have to have access to digital technologies that they have to be provided with the, the right training uh, mental health support as well after the digital fatigue and uh, the the feeling of um, you know shame or or all of these issues the, uh, that happened over the last 12 months so strategic planning was a big one uh, then again support um, something that I've already said uh, considering and addressing youth workers' learning needs and their well-being. Uh, that's also uh, something that we need to see in, in the coming uh, months or years. And finally, uh, provision. Uh, if, you, if you take a look at the, um, the, the link that I shared, there is a, a, like a very simple infographic that kind of covers these three points. Thinking about the digital uh, provision, so how do we actually uh, create technologies that are, you know, youth friendly, youth workers friendly, that don't tell you what to do with your thing, analyze you, datafy you, and um, undermine your um, human rights, <laughs> human rights privacy. Uh, you know, how do we how do we create that, and how do we uh, go forward ensuring that we all feel safe online? So these are the three things that came out from the data uh, that. Uh, should be happening. Will, will they happen? I, I don't know. Uh, I can't predict that. I, I'm probably, I know that maybe the algorithm knows better than I do about what's going to happen. So if we do get access to the algorithm, maybe they will tell us uh, about the future, but I can't tell. This is what I found in the data. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question um, for you, Alicia. Um, could you tell us more about your gender research? Oh, my gen gender digital inclusion um, yes. research. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, as some of you might know, there is um, a huge gender digital divide. And here, um, when I, uh, my research primarily focuses on um, um, girls and women, uh, we obviously have to acknowledge that, you know, gender is a, is a broad, there's a broad definition and different aspects of gender are being researched in, in different pots of research around digital technologies, and some of them are obviously under research and, and girls and uh, women's digital inclusion is also under research. Um, but it's, it's very clear that uh, girls have like less access to digital technologies overall, 
uh, it is being assumed that uh, they should constantly see things in pink, uh, pink keyboards, uh, they should see role models, they should be told that they can do it, that they are the future, and that will fix the problem. So this whole idea of, you know, um, neoliberal feminists where you are sort of considered as yourself to be a startup and you have to invest in yourself and you have to change the world. And so there are lots of narratives around that uh, when it comes to girls, which are in a sense ineffective because we need to acknowledge that um, you know, there's lots of misogyny and in digital technologies, um, girls have um, unequal chances uh, when it comes to, you know, even getting access to basic digital technologies. And obviously these uh, digital, gender digital divides are very different all over the world. Uh, their uh, cultural contexts are very different. But overall, I think there are 250 billion uh, women less uh, online than men uh, and uh, their chances uh, obviously vary uh, across uh, different continents uh, when it comes to access to devices. So I think there is there's lots of work that needs to be done to, to, to change that and uh, the way we should be doing that is also uh, another challenge because uh, some of the works that we have done so far don't really work. Um, so then again I've uh, spoken to gender digital inclusion practitioners uh, from all over the world. Uh, and I'm saying from all over the world, they, they have experience of working in different parts of the world. Um, so, so they could cover different projects. And, uh, and yeah, they told me about the, the different issues that are out there, uh, which are also kind of related to the fact that, you know, by digitally including girls and women, we also are putting them at risks because the being online is one thing, but being safe, online is another one you know there has been research um in the uk uh kind of revealing that one in two girls and non-binary people were uh you know abused online during COVID. so these spaces have become even more dangerous leading to um many people's sort of digital exclusion you know so they have to uh, lead to the silence effect you know so you uh so so then so so there is so I, I would say girls' participation uh, is limited at all aspects, from the creation of the digital technologies to its use, to the way we think about the world, uh, and to the to, you know. So so it's um, it's it's a big problem. And again, I can share more links <laughs> to some of the work that I've done so far, but I don't want to like overwhelm you with um, uh, that stuff. But uh, I can kind of maybe <laughs> chime in. I can chime in with a practice viewpoint uh, to actually confirm the same thing. Um, what we see a lot, for example, again, uh, if I'm talking about pushing uh, maker activities to the youth field, like building robots and stuff like this, and way too often, uh, the first reaction from youth work practitioners is, ah, that would be cool to do with uh, uh, the guys that are in our LAN party group. like. Mm -hmm. Why is that the first thing that comes to your mind that you'll you'll throw this thing to the gamer guys that like technology anyway? Uh, I personally think that maker activities have a huge potential in uh, bridging the gap a bit, uh, uh, making things more equal gender-wise uh, between uh, between or rather, if we manage to take those maker activities, coding, building robots, etc and giving everyone regardless of gender and background kind of a starting point or to kind of something to grab into um, i think what we often do with technology education we talk about the technology itself like this is important because uh, i don't know coding is important to learn etc but maker activities have a lot of potential to kind of tying into the things that young people already care about right uh, one example is uh, we did a project around hobby horses, which is a strange and funny and quirky <laughs> subculture in Finland where, um, where um, kids build their own hobby horses, which is basically head of a horse uh, made uh, from felt or other fabrics and on a stick. And you run around an obstacle course with the horse head on a stick, which is kind of creepy even. And we did a project in uh, combining microcontrollers with that. So you could programmable LED eyes with that. So you kind of made it 
uh, made a technology education activity out of it uh, that's still tied into something that the kids are already into. And obviously this is also a hobby group that's dominated by girls. So not selling, selling them the uh, activity as come and do this programming thing that's cool because this technology, but rather make your thing that you're already doing, make it even cooler. But also in maker activities, the, the kind of the offering is sometimes a bit strange in the sense. Um, can I also have screen sharing privileges? Oh, actually, oh, sorry, I don't need them. I can just drop the link. There's a strange thing with one of the favorite robot kits that I use. On the surface, it's nice that they offer the, uh, the kit uh, in, um, in pink and they offer it in blue. But there is the strangest thing with packaging of these kits. Uh, the company's tagline is, now I love the company, they make perfect products for youth workers and young people, no worries. But there's a strangest thing because in the box for the uh, pink Mbot robot, uh, the visuals of the code itself, they're kind of simplified, much less complicated. And the robot itself is, as you see in the picture here that I linked, that it, everything is encased in this nice and friendly, simple thing. On the blue robot, on the other hand, all the technology is exposed. You can see the circuitry, all the code in the background, even if it's a visual thing, it's much more complicated and intricate. And I want to believe from all my heart that this is just uh, two different versions of the same packaging. And this is not because the other one is the girl's model and other one is the boy's model. But these preconceptions do exist in the field, unfortunately. And that's something that all the practitioners need to be mindful of as well, that we don't build activities for guys that are, uh, they like technology anyway. Duh. Well, I do, but I'm also not all guys. Right. <laughs> I, I think it's someone just said that here in the comment about uh, my pinkification. Uh, I love pink. There's nothing wrong with pink. Pink is a beautiful color. But I think uh, what's uh, common in the field, and if you just take a quick look, depending on what browser you use, about girls' activities, uh, they very often are in pink, and uh, it's uh, it's a uh, yeah, it's a common phenomena. And also, uh, some of the people that I kind of read, they they call it the pinf pinkification of gender digital divide. So uh, the other uh, example might be, um, you know, I've reviewed lots of projects around the world, uh, which kind of focus on gender digital inclusion. And the naming of these projects are very, uh, you know, like uh, digital divas or, um, uh, you know, the digital dolls or, or yeah. so there is nothing wrong with that again. Uh, it, it's it's how you think you might attract, um, you know, uh, different gender into kind of uh, working with you in digital technologies, but it is a common thing that is happening and it is being replicated. And um, there has been some research also saying that uh, sometimes when you've got special groups uh, for girls, girls don't want to attend it because it's a minority group and it's already being treated as something else, as something that isn't, you know, the standard kind of male uh, body thing, which is the, you know, the, the normal, <laughs> but you have the the other, right? The you know, so 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 it's uh, girls say that uh, sometimes they don't want to, you know, end up in these activities because it's a minority group. Uh, and yes, uh, lots of research in Europe about um, not only parents replicating the um, stereotypes, but also, you know, just uh, um, teachers, you know, assuming that uh, girls will do certain things. And I would like to believe that we are way beyond that, and that um, as as digital youth workers, we we know that these things can be harmful, uh, but it's still quite a common problem. Uh, it's still in Europe, even. Uh, so nothing wrong with pink. I love pink, but the um, yeah, has there been studies products which are pinkified are selling better to female target group? I don't know. I actually don't know. Maybe, uh, maybe they are you know selling better uh, because yeah, because that's already a, a, a phenomenon that has been around. Uh, and I have a niece who. Um, believes that uh, pink is the right color and I've you know that this is so it's I think it's feeding into something that has been around for a long time um, so yeah how do we get away with that I don't know get well, not, not get away with that how do we 
kind of find an alternate alternative. Um, uh, other part of the question was, is it a marketing thing? I would say definitely it's a marketing thing. Even again, I don't want to sound like I'm bashing Mbot or Mblock, the maker of these robots here, because the robots themselves, they're actually identical. Like what you get in the box is exactly the same in the pink version and the blue version. Just the packaging, which is probably marketing department, mm -hmm. is different. So I think it's definitely a marketing thing. Um, but of course, we are also as youth workers in the place to kind of counteract that uh, perception that pink sells automatically or yeah. that girls should be into pink. Yeah, I think this uh, sort of uh, market idea of yourself in the digital age uh, is a very common one. And very often when we think about digital inclusion, we are saying, you know, you have to have the digital skills for the future. Jobs are changing. You need to have the job. You know, you need to you need to get into coding. Uh, girls have to do more coding, although. There is some research saying that maybe in 20 years coding will be an obsolete skill so <laughs> so it's like still kind of so so the narratives that i've seen especially around the pinification is the idea of toxic toxic optimism right so girl can do it you should in so it's this idea that you are yourself a startup and you've got a market value and you are solely responsible for ensuring that you have the right digital skills uh, that you uh, lift yourself out of a poverty or digital poverty, which is a very naive um, idea, but it's, it sells well. And I'm sure you've seen graphics like you can do it, you know, you're the best, you're uh, forget about the inequalities. So what I'm saying is that these things might be helpful, but in the grand scheme, we have to kind of uh, talk about the tox toxic issues that are in the industry, um, like you know, sexual uh, harassment, for example, burnouts uh, in the digital technologies field. So, so those those things have to be, um, and that's my role as a researcher. So it's not on you, <laughs> but uh, you know. Yeah, I can actually go on and go on to listen to you about that topic. <laughs> but um, there are a lot of other questions. I saw some. But maybe one last point, actually, Teresa and I were, were also talking last week about the topic of um, trans and non-binary and inter uh, youth who are like completely, um, it, it seems like they're completely ignored in that um, whole topic of digital youth work. But on the other side, I find like on Instagram or something, there are like these bubbles where, for example, queer kids can go and um, get information and get support and find other kids. So it's really like, but that might be a topic for another webinar, I guess. And I think the best practice for, for this type of work is uh, um, uh, LGBTQ uh, youth work in Scotland. Uh, they, you can tap into, they're, they were amazing at digital youth work. And there has been some studies as well saying that, uh, you know, um, uh, young people from uh, LGBT QI communities have actually created enormous, beautiful spaces online during COVID. Um, yeah, so they benefited from it. Um, not all of them, but yeah. Yeah. Okay, then I would uh, go on to another question. Um, there's one, Alicia, could you extend a bit more on changing metrics over time? I would spontaneously say that using the same metric over decades can also give you interesting insights. Constantly improving and evolving categories, values, norms has a big advantage that the qualitative discourse can evolve, but keeping track of measures constantly can also give reliable feedback on manifest improvements. And now the question, could you give some example of a metric that outdated completely? Yes, let me just quickly uh, take a look at this question because I've seen it too, and I want to make sure that I cover all of the points. Uh, Yes, I, I understand that uh, the idea of having those constantly improving and evolving categories is, is, is a naive one and is very complex. And I understand that we all need to kind of have a set of metrics or um, indicators that we want to use in, in our practice. So I would say, uh, you know, having them, um, having the set of indicators that is being provided to us by the funders, which could be linked to digital skills, data literacy skills, um, employability skills, uh, depending on what project you're working on. But I would always say that these things are changing. So having young people involved in the co-creation of their indicators, which I don't know what they would be, but perhaps uh, being more aware of um, how Instagram 
Instagram makes them feel in the morning, you know, uh, or how, so, so this could be an indicator, you know, this is some, I've done some work around that uh, with youth groups where we were kind of just take it, thinking about the 15 seconds in the morning when we are like um, starting our phone, what do we see? And the young people were kind of sharing what they saw and some of them seen horrible things and uh, they were kind of presenting visually the 15 seconds of their first Instagram scroll. And we were digging deeper into how this affects them and if they could do what they would, how would they take out some of those, uh, you know, and do they have the agency to actually uh, hack their own Instagram feeds so that for us was the indicator of you know for, for 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 that project right we started with that and then say okay this is what we would like to do and uh, are we going to do it uh, meeting you know the next workshop would we have we done it how do we feel about it so this is what kind of they wanted to get out of it uh, obviously my idea was there as well so it wasn't like super neutral and amazing but when it comes down to some of the uh, measures that are have been around for a long time here um I can not come up with the perfect example, but I see uh, things like, you know, um, uh, some of the things around digital skills are saying that you should uh, drag and drop. Uh, you can, you should uh, uh, learn how to do certain basic digital skills, uh, which are perhaps no longer uh, so uh, important, uh, but yet they are still there and to be measured. But again, some of the young people who are digitally excluded, they don't know how to do these things. So it's, it is important to have them around. Um, so, uh, so I'm just trying to think of an example now. Um, you know, there was uh, this has been quite a lot of uh, discussions around, you know, your problem solving skills and how do you, you know, how do you document problem solving skills? And many people argue that problem solving is no longer a skill that should be measured. More, it's about problem management or actually identifying problem and knowing how to find the right information online. So how these how these things are changing in the way we we evaluate projects. But let me think about a more specific example and uh, give me maybe just give me five minutes and I'll come up with something. So um, some of the things that I were covered in the research and then uh, hopefully I'll have the answer for you. <laughs> I kind of like the example around, for example, employability. Um, a lot of projects of youth were kind of focused on, on young people's current or future employability, depending on the age bracket that you're working with, of course. Um, and one thing is, is kind of like, okay, can you, can you write a good enough, which is always subjective, but can you write a good enough uh, application for a job? Can you write a right kind of CV? Uh, but rather looking behind that, it's a question of whether a young person can identify their uh, strengths and weaknesses or strengths to kind of also to be able to word it in a way that's uh, translatable and understandable like that's the youth work thing behind it anyone can teach uh, the proper format of a cv in word that's not and i think that shouldn't be the focus of youth work uh, but then when the world changes and suddenly companies are which they are already doing and and this kind of thing will probably be more common in the future they're asking for job applications uh, in Snapchat, like in Snapchat stories or Instagram stories. Uh, how do you translate if you're always, you, your expertise has been to teach how to create the right kind of format for a CV or a job application within yeah. Word. If you never had the discussion of how do you represent yourself or yeah. how do you identify your strengths? Probably you've had it, but maybe not in a super conscious way. So it's a matter of kind of shifting focus. And then, of course, what we measure becomes different as well. Like, have you, do you have the skill to write use word in a correct way? That's no longer relevant. It's about identifying your strengths and, and what you want to do. Yes, I, I think that's a perfect indicator for, uh, you know, uh, the Snapchat stories. And I think I really like it because this is so different, you know, this isn't, Something that you consider as an employability skill is just silly stuff on on Snapchat. But yet again, it is it proves that you know it's grounded in the actual young people's experience. And you definitely shouldn't make a new indicator measuring whether a young person can make a successful Snapchat story because in one and a half years, Snapchat could be out of the door. Kids could be using something else. But rather, when you're you are working within youth work, so 
make the indicator about you, the youth work process and not the tool, whether it's Word or Snapchat or Instagram or the next big thing. They change so quickly that, especially if you want to measure long term, it needs to be about the youth work because the core doesn't change that much in the end. Okay, thank you. Mm, I'm a bit lost in the chat. Is there another question uh, that hasn't been answered? I think we're good actually. And I think we're perfect in, in our timing. That's true. So again, there are a lot of recommendations and a lot of links in the chat. Take your time to check them out. Um, we will also post them uh, probably on our home page on the web page of the event. Yes. Especially like the two more general links, so you don't have to save everything, but you can come back to our to our web page and, and look them up again if you don't find if you have like don't find anything anymore. Let me just stop this link. <laughs> so yeah, you can check it out later. Okay. Um, oh, I'm not. Um, yeah, so thank you for your interesting questions. Um, before we come to an end today, um, we have prepared, prepared a Padlet. Teresa will post the link in the chat. Um, and before you click on it, I will um, quickly explain it. Most of you, I guess, already know this. Um, we would like, um, we would ask you to leave us a comment um, about what you have learned today, what you've taken with you, um, which topics, ideas are relevant for your work and which questions remain unanswered. And yeah, when you just click on the link, you will see some questions and then you can just click on the little plus sign and can leave us a comment. Yeah, but before you do that, I would like to thank you all for joining today and participating. And a special thanks goes to you and Alicia, thank you for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Uh, it was really nice. And, uh, and I would like to thank GIG, the Global Innovation Gathering, also a co-act partner from us who supported us with promoting the webinar. And yeah, I think from our side, that's it for today. Um, please just um, click on the link and leave us a comment. And then I would say, have a nice evening and bye. Thank you very much for having the, me and us today. <laughs> Thank you.